Hello, I'm Alexander. I am presenting our work on understanding the accessibility challenges faced by people with aphasia when consuming audiovisual media. This work was done by myself, my PhD advisors Tim and Elena from King's College London, and with the help of Madeleine from City University of London. Audiovisual media is very important in the modern world and impacts many aspects of our lives, from TV to streaming platforms, social media content, as well as exciting novel experiences. We interact with audiovisual media daily and rely on it to stay informed, express ourselves artistically, and much more. This media, however, can be challenging to access for people with disabilities, such as blind or visually impaired people or people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Past research has explored ways to improve access for many communities, developing technologies that improve this access, such as subtitles or audio descriptions. Additionally, with novel technologies, new opportunities have come about to change the way audiovisual media is consumed, such as with mixed, augmented, and virtual realities. These introduce many possibilities in improving accessibility, however, can also introduce new access challenges. While existing research has explored a wide range of accessibility challenges and worked with disabled communities to design technologies, our understanding for the challenges faced by communities with complex communication needs have been relatively underexplored. This includes people with aphasia, a communication impairment that often occurs after a stroke and can affect various aspects of language, such as speaking, understanding speech, reading, or writing. Therefore, to address this gap, we try to answer two main questions in this work. First, does aphasia affect audiovisual media viewing? The answer to this question has so far not been looked at, usually relying on anecdotal evidence. And two, what aspects of audiovisual media affects the viewing experience for people with aphasia? To address these questions, we conducted two studies with people with aphasia. We ran an online survey and two focus group sessions at an aphasia charity near London. The online survey resulted in quantitative data on the overall challenges comparing pre- and post-aphasia viewing experiences. The focus group offered qualitative data in support of the online survey, allowing us to understand concrete challenges faced. The online survey was shared via online aphasia support groups in three countries. We received responses from 41 people across four charities, which we would like to thank. For demographics, 21 participants identified as female and 20 as male. Respondents were between 30 and 90 years old with an average age of 59. Participants could be assisted by someone else, such as a friend or family member, but only four respondents did so. We designed the survey using previous experiences, guidelines for designing for aphasia, and recommendations from speech and language therapists and fellow researchers. Most questions included multiple choice or Likert scale answers, with optional text entry if they wanted to give an example or qualify their answers. The questions asked respondents about their language abilities, the context in which they consume media, such as the device used, and their viewing experiences prior to aphasia and their viewing experiences with aphasia. Questions and multiple choice answers were accompanied by images. Looking at the quantitative results, we find that aphasia significantly negatively affects all viewing aspects. For instance, the overall viewing experience decreased from an average pre-aphasia score of 4.55 out of 5 to 2.83 or a mean difference of negative 1.72. We conducted a Wilkinson signed rank test to verify the significance of these shifts and see that these results were statistically significant and that the results had strong effect sizes. Additionally, we looked at the correlation between the participants' self-reported language abilities and their scores for the different viewing aspects. We see, for instance, that understanding spoken language was strongly positively correlated with lower scores in all viewing aspects, much more so than other language abilities. Some reflections on running this online study and its results. This was the first study to show concrete evidence that aphasia negatively impacts viewing experience, instead of relying on anecdotal evidence or general assumptions based on complex communication needs more broadly. Running this survey may have led to a positively biased sample in favor of people with milder forms of aphasia, as accessing online text-based surveys may be challenging for some. The results indicate that aphasia has a significant negative impact on viewing experience. This suggests that more severe forms of aphasia might have even worse results. Additionally, looking at language aspects with the biggest effect on viewing, understanding spoken language was most likely to cause challenges. This can suggest directions for future research. To supplement the quantitative results of the first study, we ran focus group sessions which provided us with insightful qualitative data. We ran two sessions at a charity and support group for people with aphasia called Discover, which we want to thank. We had 10 participants, 5 in each of the two sessions. 5 of the participants identified themselves as female and 5 as male. They were aged between 52 and 70 with an average age of 59. They have had aphasia for between 3 and 16 years, with an average of 8 years. 
We opened up the sessions with an initial open discussion on challenges they faced when viewing audiovisual media. Following this, we ran a video critiquing activity in which we presented the participants with 11 short videos averaging at 63 seconds. These videos represented various genres, selected to reflect wide range of content and possible challenges. All of this was assisted by a speech and language therapist with experience with people with aphasia, and communication aids were provided such as paper-based visual aids or pen and paper. We gave ample time for everyone to express themselves as well as providing a break halfway through the session. After transcribing the videos of the sessions, making sure to include nonverbal communication, we coded the transcripts and performed thematic analysis of the main barriers faced, as well as aspects of audiovisual media that acted as facilitators to their viewing. We outlined four main themes along with subthemes, as can be seen here. The most evoked barrier participants mentioned were barriers around understanding speech. Speech clarity can make viewing difficult, as effort is put on trying to make out the words, adding additional work for the viewer. Because Sometimes you can't always hear them speaking clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Accent or dialect can also play into this, as strong accents can also require more work into understanding what is being said. Fast-paced speech also significantly hinders the viewing experience, as keeping up with what is being said and processing it can be very challenging. It, um, it was a challenge because it was so quick, but uh, uh, the saving grace was it is short uh, questions yes. and short answers yeah. and uh, if it uh, uh, if it was the news that goes on and on and on but it was short yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, okay. background noise also plays an important role as making out dialogue can be more strenuous the next theme are barriers involving cognitive load including various aspects of audiovisual media viewing that can weigh on the viewer. For instance, the stamina required to keep focus makes it tiring to keep up with the information coming in, making other issues more problematic. This can be exacerbated when the amount of information increases, such as when there are multiple speakers, as this represents information coming in from multiple sources, requiring the viewer to keep track and add additional cognitive load. Limited processing time, such as moving on to the next piece of information before the viewer fully grasps the previous piece, also acts as a barrier. Um, I listen, but then I have to uh, comprehend. Um, it takes a minute for it to comprehend and then uh, rushing on to the next one. Yeah. Rapid on-screen action can represent increased visual information that requires additional effort to keep track of, along with simultaneous narrative information. Long complex language is generally considered more difficult for people with aphasia. This can also be the case in audiovisual media. On-screen text and subtitles being text and requiring the viewer to read it can pose significant barriers. Limited reading time, in which text appears on the screen too quickly, requires the viewer to focus on the text at the expense of other information. Not only can the text be a barrier in of itself, having limited reading time adds additional time pressure and efforts from the viewer. But, as I say, it's words. My brain can't that. Not that fast. Yeah. Having large amounts of text represents a different barrier, as the text can be difficult to parse and many viewers might not bother reading, feeling overwhelmed. Following the narrative of what's happening on screen is also a pain point for many. The lack of visual cues or visual information to reinforce the narrative can divide the viewer's attention and lead to increased confusion. Literally, it was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> So it wasn't helping you, it wasn't no, helping you no. to understand. Yeah. <laughs> Rapid narrative or visual shifts mean less time to process what is happening, which, once again, can lead to confusion. An example of how narratives can be complicated for people with aphasia is understanding comedy. Focusing on the words being said can make viewers miss the intended meaning of the words, such as the punchline or irony in a statement. When accessing audiovisual media, the viewer's ability to understand language is integral, as language is used to convey information and meaning. This can be prohibitively challenging for people with aphasia, requiring additional cognitive effort to simply understand what is being said. Moreover, this barrier into interacted with barriers presented by other viewing aspects. For instance, fast-paced dialogue requires additional cognitive effort from the viewer and can lead to them missing some other information or quickly growing tired. 
It is important to note that, due to the temporal aspects of audiovisual medium, experiencing a barrier at one point is likely to lead to more challenges later. This can be thought of as cascading failure. Experiencing one barrier leads to more work required to recoup lost information, leading to a higher likelihood of them experiencing other challenges. This is in part due to the viewer not being able to control the rate of information, which impacts all four main themes. Controlling the pace is currently possible, such as through pausing or rewinding, but is frustrating and reduces enjoyment. There are some viewing aspects that can work as facilitators to the viewing experience. Think of this as the opposite to the barriers. Are background sounds too loud and distracting? Reduce those in favor of key auditory information. Is fast-paced speech problematic? A slower pace of speech can help. These things are not always available to viewers and are often artistic decisions. Many existing accessibility interventions that may help some overcome such issues, such as subtitles or audio descriptions, don't work for many people with complex communication needs. To allow viewers to access these facilitators would require large-scale changes in the way audiovisual media is produced or the use of sophisticated tools while viewing. Thinking about directions for future research, more variable accessibility interventions are required. This can be explored using personalization and customization of content, for instance using novel technologies such as is object-based media. That is, a method of creating and experiencing audiovisual media in which content is rendered at playtime, supported by underlying metadata. This allows for the creation of highly personalized content and can allow for viewing aspects that act as barriers to be altered, such as reducing the volume of background audio tracks to improve dialogue understandability. Such methods require, however, a considerable change in the way audiovisual media is produced. Such levels of personalization can also be achieved by leveraging advanced machine learning systems, for example, dynamically altering aspects of the image to fit viewer preferences, or offering a second screen support through scene summaries or chatbot powered by large language models. These accessibility interventions do pose some fundamental tensions, such as tensions regarding the artistic vision, or issues with bias and norms, and how these shape society. For example, the participants in our focus group discuss their preference for British received pronunciation, or how David Attenborough speaks, and struggling with strong Northern or Scottish accents. Personalization that allows viewers to replace these accents in favor of more, so to say, proper English can be deeply problematic. Think about classist and racist rhetoric around various dialects. It is also important to note that disabled voices and experiences are often missing from AI training data, perpetuating a normative vision of the world and erasing people with disabilities. It is therefore important to involve a wide range of stakeholders when developing these ideas, including people with disabilities, content creators, speech and language therapists, and technologists from diverse backgrounds. To conclude, access to audiovisual media is both important and complicated. Various of its aspects act as barriers, hindering the viewing experience of people with aphasia. In this work, we present initial research looking at how challenging audiovisual media is and what barriers people with aphasia face. We discuss how these barriers interact with each other and lead to cascading failures. We also discuss various aspects of audiovisual media that can facilitate viewing. Finally, we discuss possible avenues for future research and the importance of diverse participation. Thank you for listening.